Dr. Love, Dr. Michelle Jones is in the house. Good. Thank you. Hey, Charles. Betty Wingate is here. Carolyn Smith is here. Hey, Carolyn. Faye Johnson is here. Beatrice Cox is here. Good evening, everybody. My name is Charles Love. I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Political Action Committee of the Social Justice Ministry Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Friendship Missionary Baptist Church and our community partners to this, the first of two political forums. This time I'd like to acknowledge our partners. They comprise the members of the Alpha Lambda Omega chapter and the Rho Psi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, the Charlotte Alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Democracy North Carolina, the League of Women's Voters of Mecklenburg, St. Paul Baptist Church and Temple Bethel. Uh, this evening's forum will feature candidates running for governor, lieutenant governor, general state auditor, attorney general, commissioner of insurance, labor, and the superintendent of public instruction. We invited candidates for all of the contested positions in Mecklenburg County and the state. They were all contacted by mail, email, and telephone. They were all invited and all that responded will be here tonight. We'd like to inform you that Josh Stein did confirm that he would be here, but because of the disaster in Western North Carolina, he is there helping with the recovery efforts. We want to announce also that there'll be no questions in the chat because of the number of candidates. And we want to remind you that there is a survey in the chat that we'd like for you to complete at the end of the forum. I'll now have our invocation by Dr. Michelle Jones, the Associate Minister at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. Let us pray. Divine Creator, thank you for giving us the breath of life. Thank you for the social justice ministry and the various partners in creating this needed forum so we can be educated about the candidates as well as the political process. I also would be remiss if I didn't ask for a continued protection for those who've been affected by the hurricane because they're those who still do not have water and still do not have power. So I ask that you would continue to give them grace and mercy. But for this immediate moment, thank you for this opportunity to commune with you. Thank you for this opportunity to commune with the candidates. And I ask this prayer in your name, Jesus to Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Jones. I'd like to introduce to you now our moderator for this evening's forum, Mr. Mike Evans. Mike is a retired public accountant, certified public accountant, and certified financial planner. 
He has managed and or advised political campaigns for the city of Charlotte, the city council, Mecklenburg County Commission, district and superior court, district attorney, and the North Carolina legislature. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Love. As shown on the screen, uh, we will hear from Council of State Offices in the following order. Superintendent of Public Education, State Treasurer, Governor, State Auditor, and Attorney General. I will engage each candidate individually. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement and listen carefully, up to two minutes to address questions that I ask. We ask each candidate to put his or her contact information in the chat when it's their turn to speak so that if there are questions that the streaming audience has that I don't ask, you will be able to contact the candidates directly. Each candidate will also have one minute for a close. Our timekeepers, Shauna Pryor and Katura Clark Withers will display the time remaining on the screen. So it will be visible at all times. And we ask that each of our candidates be mindful of the time limits. So if we're ready, let's get started. We'll start with the superintendent of public education. The superintendent of public education is the secretary and chief administrative officer of the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education consists of 13 members, the Lieutenant Governor, the State Treasurer, and 11 members appointed by the Governor. The Superintendent and the State Board of Education are responsible for implementing the state's laws for pre-K through 12th grade public schools. The Department of Public Instruction, led by the superintendent, develops the standard course of study, which describes the subjects and course content taught in NC public schools and the assessments and accountability model used to evaluate student, school, and district success. Mo Green, the Democratic candidate, and Michelle Morrill, the Republican candidate, are with us this evening. We'll begin with Mr. Green. Mr. Green, you have one minute for your opening statement. Great, thank you, and good evening to all. Thanks to all the wonderful sponsors for allowing us to have a conversation about public education. I'm gonna talk about experience, vision, and soul. Certainly, I believe that I have the experience as a school district leader, including former superintendent of Guilford County Schools, to handle this position exceedingly well. I have managed and led enormous and complex educational organizations. Vision. My vision for North Carolina public schools is guided by a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education, and combine it with a focus on excellence. That is what we utilized when I was superintendent of Guilford County Schools, where we saw increases in graduation rates, student achievement, and was recognized as a national district of character. And then finally, the very soul of public education is on the ballot this November, and it is going to take champions of public education to meet this moment. Thank you, Mr. Green. We've even got a little music too. All right, if elected, what would be your top priorities? So my top priorities uh, would include uh, focusing on uh, advocating for increased uh, funding for our public schools, uh, increased compensation for our educators, and certainly also improving student achievement. Uh, now, let me unpack each of those. In North Carolina, we find ourselves in 48 compared to the other states with regards to funding of our public schools. And so we must increase that number uh, if you compare us to the national average, where the national average is about $16,000 per student, um, Virginia is a little over $14,000 per student, South Carolina is over $15,000 per student, North Carolina is a little over $11,000 per student. So there's need for additional resources in our public schools. 
Then related to that is where would I put those resources? Certainly I'd be advocating for increased compensation for our educators, particularly our teachers, where again, we find in North Carolina, we're spiraling close towards the bottom uh, quartile uh, with regards to funding of our educators. And then finally, I do believe that we need to work on improving student outcomes um, and we'll be focused on providing differentiated resources to support students uh, in schools and school districts, particularly those that might be lower performing um, and know how to do that given my experience as a former superintendent of Guilford County Schools where we had at the time when I arrived the most low performing schools in the entire state, worked on lots of strategies to help bring up those performances to the point where none of those schools under the old accountability metrics were considered low performing by the end of my tenure. Okay. How would you work with this, the legislature to secure additional funds? Great. So I believe that uh, the way that I work uh, is now a brand, if you will, but it is to listen, learn, and then lead. And the brand uh, that started when I was superintendent of Guilford County Schools is called Mo Wants to Know. And so the way that I operate is I'm engaging with legislators. I will engage with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, hear what their concerns are, where there might be places for us to move forward. I will put forward uh, suggestions of things that we might do as well. And then I also try to work in a very collaborative way, meaning in this instance, that I do believe that this isn't something I do solely by myself. Um, I believe we've got to have lots of different voices um, that might be heard by different people in different ways, but will be understood as a way to increase funding in our public schools. And so we'll be calling on various communities um, to engage with, with me as we put forward reasons why we need to have additional funding in our schools. And then I'll also say this, I do think that it also requires uh, that in the General Assembly, many of those members know me because I stood up, for, for for example, with public school educators when they tried to take away their career status. We filed a lawsuit to prevent that for those who had already earned it. I was the only individually named plaintiff in that lawsuit. And so there are times when I have to believe, I believe I have to stand up and say, this is what must happen. And so certainly we'll try to be in a collaborative manner but also feel like there are times when you have to, to be very direct and certain about how we're going to move forward. It appears that there are not clear lines of authority between the superintendent and the state board of education. How do you see that relationship working and how do you work collaboratively with that body, which is appointed by the governor uh, to advance public education? Yeah, so in my instance, I believe that uh, you start off with uh, trying to have a very collaborative uh, relationship. Again, at this point, I rely a lot on my career experience. Um, and so going back to when I was superintendent of Guilford County Schools, I actually arrived in that position on a seven to four vote. So that means that there were four folks who immediately wanted someone else to be their superintendent. But it was because of the way that I operate that Mo wants to know methodology, if you will, the collaborative way that I operate, that it was only a several months later that folks said, you know, and a couple even said on TV, live TV, we made a mistake. We should have hired Mo Green of those four. So that's the way that I work. And in this instance, as it turns out, I believe that uh, we'll start off with a, in a very good place because um, the leadership are folks that know me well. For example, the current chair, Eric Davis, you know, he was from Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. He knows my work from when I was um, deputy superintendent, chief operating officer and general counsel there. And the vice chair is Alan Duncan. Alan Duncan was uh, the board chair for Guilford County Schools when I was superintendent of Guilford County Schools. So we'll start off, I believe with a, um, you know, very, um, with a relationship that I think will start off in a very positive way right from the outset. 
You have said that a bold vision is needed to improve the public education system. Do you have that bold vision? And if so, what can you share with us? Absolutely. So the vision is, as I shared earlier, we'll utilize a, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education and combine it with a focus on excellence. And so I tell folks all the time, like when I was in superintendent of Guilford County Schools, there I said, we're going to be the very best district in the state. Now I'll be saying the same thing about where we want to land as a in the, across the country. And so that vision then will require a number of activities and have a set of pillars, if you will. Folks can go online to see more of the information and in more detail. You can go to mogreenfornc.com and look up pillars and you'll start to see how we will execute on it, but it will include things from, you know, revering our educators um, to lots of work with um, curriculum and standard course of study um, to um, certainly working with lots of our children and education, recognizing there's lots of good. We just need to build on that as we move forward. And just so just so folks have a sense, then that same vision allows you a 70s, so almost 90 percent is now over taking and passing college level courses, uh, international baccalaureate exams, and then also be recognized as a national district of care. Proficiency scores and graduation rates are uneven across the state. What strategies might you employ to level the playing field and Absolutely. to lift those low performing areas up? Absolutely. And so as a, and at the outset, I do want us to orient ourselves to an understanding that those proficiency scores may be um, ones that uh, we need to explore to be sure that they are actually representing what's actually happening with our students. Not to suggest that uh, we don't have room and need for improvement with our proficiency scores, but they may not be the best uh, indicator of where our students actually are. But the things that I will work on, um, we'll certainly continue the work that we've uh, that the state board and superintendent have done with early literacy skills, um, utilizing the science of reading uh, to teach uh, early literacy skills. And in fact, I served on a leadership team for North Carolina um, that worked with five other states on implementing early literacy skills. So I have lots of experience in trying to move that forward. Second, I do believe that we are going to have to um, certainly uh, be sure that we set the expectations high, that we have the kind of leadership in our school boards and in our schools, uh, superintendent, and in, even in our school buildings that can uh, change outcomes. I'm told, for example, when I was superintendent, I did the most um, certainly turnaround schools uh, in our entire state um, to try to change out the trajectory. So that included removing entire staff. Love them, but you're not working for our students. And so you have to do those kind of dramatic things to improve outcomes. Uh, we'll certainly look at disaggregating data and then put in plans necessary to address those deficiencies while also lifting up student performance as well. Final question. Why are you the better candidate in this race? Great, so I'll lift up three things. Experience, belief, and character. So experience. You've heard a little bit about mine. I served as superintendent of Guilford County Schools prior for seven and a half years. Um, third largest district in the state. Prior to that, served as the uh, general counsel and deputy superintendent for Charlotte-Mecklenburg Schools. Also have served in other leadership roles impacting and associated with public education. My opponent, she homeschools her children. Nothing against homeschooling, 
but this position as you outlined is the chief administrative officer for public schools, manages $11 billion annually. You might wanna have somebody who has the experience to do that. Number two, belief. I believe in our public schools. My wife and I, we put our children in our public schools. My opponent, again, homeschools her children, nothing against that, uh, but also goes further in disparaging our public schools to the point that you have to question whether there's really a belief in them. Has called for the abolishment of the State Board of Public Education as an example. Has also called our public schools cesspool, absolute cesspools of evil, lies, and deception. Says that they've been taken over by Satan. And then third, character. You heard what we did in Guilford County Schools where we want to take to the national, to the state level with regards to the character development. As opposed to my opponent, who took her children to the attempted insurrection on January 6th, comes back, puts herself on video and suggests that there needs to be, um, you know, setting aside the U.S. Constitution, needs to be, um, you know, bring in the, invoke the Insurrection Act and bring in the military. This is a person who's called for the executions of many, including Barack Obama. I would say there's a clear distinction with regards to character as well. Thank you, Mr. Green. You now have one minute for your closing statement. Right. So it would, thanks again for allowing me this opportunity. It would be an honor and a privilege for me to be the superintendent of public instruction for the state of North Carolina. As I have already indicated, I do think that there are clear distinctions between me and my opponent. And I would encourage folks to understand those distinctions as they are uh, exploring who to be supportive of uh, as it relates to moving our um, state public education system forward. There is real work that must be done. Um, and I don't believe it's appropriate or for us to be, uh, in this instance, led by somebody who has the kind of character, beliefs, and lack of experience necessary to move that work forward. Thanks again for giving me this opportunity this evening. Uh, Y'all be blessed. Thank you. The Republican candidate in this race is Michelle Morrow. Has uh, Ms. Morrow joined us? Hmm. I believe we gave her a 6.50 time to, to join us. Bye-bye. Mm. All right, Mr. Green, thank you. Okay. As we stated, there are two candidates in this race. Mo Green, who you just heard from, is the Democratic candidate. Uh, Michelle Morrill is the Republican candidate. Uh, note that Michelle Morrill defeated the incumbent superintendent of public instruction in the Republican primary. So this is an open seat with the two candidates running against each other. And I'm hoping that Ms. Morrill will join us at any minute here. I uh, just got word that she's having difficulty getting in. Can we address that shortly? She's not in the waiting room, sir. Uh, okay. Hmm. Okay, and we have given, uh, let me just explain how this uh, has been organized. There are eight candidates to come before us this evening, and each was given uh, an approximate time to uh, join us. And uh, unfortunately, as mentioned earlier, we did have a cancellation uh, with Attorney General Josh Stein, who's uh, hard at work uh, with the hurricane relief effort in 
the western part of the state. So we've been trying to juggle uh, our schedule to meet the needs of the candidates. Some have told us they can only appear at a certain time and they need to jump off the call at a certain time. And uh, we've tried to accommodate them as best we can to maximize the number of candidates uh, that would participate. Uh, so our next candidate uh, is Wesley Harris, and we gave him a 710 slot, and I know he's not on the call yet. Um, Ms. Morrill is still not in. I think she's being given instructions. Uh, Sir, so she's not in the waiting room. If she wants to reach out to me directly, I can help her get in. Okay. I think Miss Evans may be communicating with her right now. Let me also say that we started with this race and normally the Department of Public Instruction or Superintendent of Public Instruction race is very low key and you typically uh, don't hear a lot from the candidates and you may be unfamiliar uh, with the race. This year is somewhat of an exception. There's been a lot of publicity, not only within the state, but also nationally uh, regarding this race. And they're two very different candidates um, in the race. Uh, you've heard from uh, Mo Green and he shared with you his philosophy, his vision. Uh, it is very different than Ms. Morrill's vision and I hope that she will join us shortly so she can uh, share that uh, with us. But this race has really attracted attention and I hope it's one that you will pay attention to. I know that the focus is on the presidential race and clearly that's very important. And the governor's race and clearly that is important as well. Uh, but there are a number of races on our ballot and I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to encourage you to vote the entire ballot. Don't just vote for president, for governor, uh, for some of the other sexier offices and, and stop at that point. Please vote all the way down uh, the ballot. It's really, really, really important. And certainly the education of our kids should be one of our main priorities. So I would invite you to take a close look at each of these candidates. Look at their background, their education, their positions, their vision, their priorities, and make an educated choice whatever that is. I'm gonna start singing in a minute, <laughs> but I, I don't think you want me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Are we still trying to get Miss Morrow on? And I, I apologize for the delay. Um, FYI, my wife is one of the organizers of this event, and I hear her upstairs on the phone trying to make this happen. Um, and hopefully she'll have some success shortly. Uh, but while we wait, the next position that we'll discuss is a state treasurer. And I know that uh, the candidate is probably not online yet uh, because we gave him a 710 time. But let me just share with you that the treasurer is responsible for managing the state's investments, their pension, their health care plans. They're involved with unclaimed property and the state's operating funds should note that North Carolina is one of only three states that uses a sole trustee model for managing its pension funds. 
What that means is the treasurer has the sole authority to make investment decisions. Many states, and in fact, I believe most states have moved away from that and they use a committee or board approach to assist the treasurer in making uh, such decisions. Our current treasurer uh, ran for governor in the Republican primary, he was not successful. So this is an open seat. And the current treasurer has received a fair amount of criticism uh, because he invested state pension monies relatively conservatively. Um, his first rule, I guess, was not to lose money. But as a result, he didn't generate the kinds of returns he could have in this period when the stock market generated above average rates of return. So one of the things that the treasurer has to do is balance what's called the risk return trade-off. How much risk am I willing to take? And as you well know, that if you only take a little bit of risk, your potential return is low. And in order to generate higher rates of return, you've got to take on more risk. And each state has to decide where they want to be on that spectrum to try to balance risk and return. Um, it is also interesting to note that North Carolina enjoys a triple A credit rating. What that means is we are able to borrow at the lowest cost among our, our peer states. Uh, our finances are considered to be uh, in good shape, and, and we want to maintain that AAA credit rating. That is the role uh, of the treasurer. We will hear from one candidate tonight, the Democratic candidate for treasurer, uh, Wesley Harris. He does have Republican uh, opposition. Uh, the Republican candidate uh, did not elect to participate, but we should have uh, Mr. Harris online in about uh, 10 minutes or so. Okay. Has Ms. Morrill joined us? I just uh, learned that uh, Ms. Morrill is calling our uh, IT person, and hopefully she will be joining us <laughs> very shortly. I apologize for this delay. In order to um, maximize your time and not keep you waiting while Ms. Morrill attempts to uh, log on, um, 
I believe Wayne Turner is with us. Is that correct? Is he on? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye-bye. Mr. Evans, I'm working with Ms. Morrow to get her online. Get, get, okay. Get her, please. She's going to try a different phone, so she's she's trying that now. All right. Kate, is, are you Michelle Morrow? Are we making any progress? Uh, Kate, um, there are a couple of people that just joined. Are any of you uh, Ms. Morrow or her campaign manager? Ms. Morrow? Let me call her again, sir. All right. In the in the interest of time, let's move to the governor's race. Uh, we do have uh, Mr. Wayne Turner on with us. Mr. Turner is the Green Party candidate for governor. Uh, welcome, Mr. Turner. Thank you. You have one minute for your opening statement. My name is Wayne Turner, and I'm running for the Office of Governor on behalf of the North Carolina Green Party. I was born in North Carolina. I was educated here in the public schools and in the state university system. I spent most of my life working here in different occupations. The Green Party is associated in most people's minds with the environment and environmental preser uh, preservation. This is certainly a concern since our literal survival as a species depends upon it. The Greens know that people struggling to survive economically won't be able to spare the energy and the effort to support environmental preservation or ecological sustainability. So we must address all the issues relating to people's daily lives, such as the economy, education, health care, child care, debt, affordable housing, and labor issues. So that the challenge facing us, both as a state and a nation, is how to develop an economic system 
that both alleviates the ills of poverty, hunger, and homelessness, and at the same time leaves future generations environmental conditions that will provide them with the same benefits we enjoy today. Thank you, Mr. Turner. You have one minute for opening and up to two minutes to respond to questions, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. A third party candidate has not exceeded 3% of the vote for a council of state race during the last few election cycles. Uh, in light of this fact, why are you running and do you expect to win? Well, uh, since people can vote for me, whether I win or not depends on whether enough people vote for me. People have to make the choice to vote for something uh, maybe outside of their experience a little bit, but certainly I could win. It simply depends on people voting for me. I run because I feel like minor, minor party candidates and independent candidates have as much right to have their voices and ideas heard as anyone from the major parties. In fact, because of the um, exclu rather exclusive electoral system we have built where, where the main advantages of participation and the ability to participate goes entirely to those two parties, many, many voices are excluded from our system. The largest number of, of voters in, the, in North Carolina and, and, and becoming so across the nation are simply unaffiliated voters. They don't find their home in the parties anymore. And so I'm running to tell people that there are alternatives and they should be considered. Have you previously held elective office? I have not. However, I have spent the last 20 plus years observing North Carolina and national politics, working to, to in minor party politics to get uh, parties and independents on the ballot. I've attended numerous legislative and uh, municipal county hearings to testify on uh, various issues. I do have some familiarity with government and some understanding of it. And looking at your webpage, you advocate for major changes in the criminal justice system. Yes, I do. Including the abolishment of prisons. I do. What is your vision for a reimagined criminal justice system? Several of the Scandinavian countries do a better job of this than we do. Our prison systems uh, claim to be designed to rehabilitate, but that's not really what they do. They just punish. Warehousing people in, in um, you know, bad living conditions with uh, spotty access to education, banning books, not allowing them to read, um, force them to live with people that are dangerous to them. None of this is going to rehabilitate prisoners. Our prisons are much more about punishment than they are about rehabilitation. Uh, North Carolina is better than some states in their regard, certainly states like uh, Louisiana with its infamous Angola prison are much, much worse. But uh, our society shows no incentive to treat prisons as anything other than uh, warehousing for people that they would rather not be around or not have on the streets. Uh, this isn't a good way to approach, approach society. We have to recognize that most crimes are economic crimes. People that commit economic crimes do so because they don't have jobs, they don't have support. They haven't had adequate opportunities in their lives. Uh, we need to be pointed toward offering those people a chance to participate in society as opposed to simply locking them away and forgetting about them. Prisons represent a social failure, a failure of society. The author Emma Goldman pointed this out in the early, not early 20th century. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't people out there that need to be segregated from society. There's nothing that demands that we treat them in a dehumanizing manner, um, simply in pursuit of revenge. Ever. If elected governor, what would be your top priorities? I have three priorities. The first is public education, because I've seen the attacks on public education over the last three decades, and I'm very um, much worried that if we continue to allow our public education to degrade, that, that education will first become a commodity because we already have private equity moving into education, uh, which will restratify our society along, along the lines of income and race. We don't want that. 
um, if we do not um, fully fund public education in accordance with the Andrew decision, uh, we will fall into that situation. Uh, it simply isn't possible for everyone here to be privately educated, and it's not a good idea either. What is your educational and professional background, and what has prepared you to make this run for governor? Well, my uh, professional back, well, my educational background is largely in uh, mathematics and technology. I have a degree in applied mathematics from NCSU and a degree in automation technology. Um, and of course, I've spent much of my career working in different fields, but it, it just hasn't all been. Uh, I mean, I've been a research engineer, I've taught mathematics, but I've also worked in the trades and have a pretty good appreciation for the ver the range of various jobs across that people can occupy across the uh, the the spectrum of work. Uh, the challenges the state is facing today are really not any longer. Um, excuse me, I have a technical problem. Um, don't seem to be falling uh, before our um, business as usual approach. We need new ideas on how to handle ourselves economically in this time. Um, for example, I believe the state should uh, implement public banking uh, following the North Dakota model. Um, I believe um, that the um, the breadth of my experience, my my uh, the depth of my education, and my um, almost insatiable desire to understand everything there is about our state and the people that live and work in it uh, qualify me to uh, pursue this position. Yeah, why are you the best candidate in this race? Well, I probably just partially answered that. Um, as I say, I, I don't feel that the way we've been approaching economic problems in, in North Carolina have been over, overly successful. We have lots and lots of people moving to the state, but we don't have services for them. We continuously cut our public budgets and expect that the private sector will pick these things up, but the private sector is not going to allow us, for example, to have universal health care. The private sector is not going to solve our child care problems. We have roughly only 15% of the working families in the state can access child care. The state is going to have to step up into this. Um, we, we need to consider uh, new forms of economic activity like worker cooperatives, as opposed to trying to uh, attract out-of-state businesses that simply uh, vacuum up our money and then export it elsewhere. I believe um, these ideas, along with my work experience, make me the best candidate. Thank you, Mr. Turner. You now have one minute for a closing statement. Again, my thanks for allowing me to participate this evening. Uh, I noted that in my opening statement, or would have noted that our responsibilities to the future, our children and subsequent generations deserve clean air and water and also a chance to live their lives to the fullest extent and work and play. We have to do several things to achieve this. One is we need more democratic participation in our state's policy decisions on funding these services, which I believe it is the state's responsibility to provide to its citizens. This includes public education, adequate staffing in our council state offices, adequate support for the Department of Environmental Quality and its sub-agencies, and also for the Department of Labor. These offices have been routinely underfunded. We have to consider new ideas to support economic development. I advocate for the state to establish a public state-owned bank following the model of North Carolina of North Dakota, whose profits remain an asset to the state. I, I advocate for more worker-owned property businesses. We have to begin to educate the broader public about the environmental impacts of our economic decisions and start weighing the need for immediate economic benefits against the impact on future generations. Thank you, Mr. Turner. <clears throat>
Thank you for your participation. Best of Thank luck. You. Okay. I understand that uh, Ms. Morrill is, has joined us. Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. We have heard from your opponent in this race. Uh -huh. And now we want to hear from you. So you have one minute for an opening statement. And then we will give you up to two minutes to address some questions that I will pose after your opening statement. Okay, sounds perfect. Yes, you now I'm, have the floor. Thank you. I am Michelle Morrow, and I am a nurse, a teacher, a mom of five, and a very concerned citizen. And I am running for to be the next state superintendent because I want to bring safety. I want to focus on academic excellence. I want to expand our career and technical and vocational trainings across the state of North Carolina. And I want to ensure that our finances, our hard-earned tax money is going into the classrooms first instead of upper level bureaucracy and administration. I am very concerned with the literacy crisis, with the exodus of students and staff from our schools across the state, as well as um, the increase in drug use and violence and gang activity um, across North Carolina. And I have an idea to, um, to get back on track for North Carolina uh, schools. What plans do you have to increase the safety of our children? I absolutely want to increase the amount of um, student resource officers in all of our schools. I would like to see even a statewide student resource officer um, uh, program so that we're actually preparing them so that they have the training that they need um, and they can serve our students and our staff. I also want to bring about a code of conduct where our consequences are going to be very clear for those students who are disruptive and keeping our other students from being able to learn. Um, the number one reason why teachers give for leaving is that they the lack of discipline, the chaos in the classrooms, and that they are not able to, um, to actually teach. There's too much going on behavior behaviorally. And so we have to make the number one role of administrators to create a culture of civility and respect and discipline so that learning can happen. Um, and I want to ensure we need metal detectors clearly. We also need video surveillance um, in, in our schools so that we know who's on our property outside as well as what's going on inside of our schools. And um, all of that all of that is going to make our schools the safest buildings in the state. I have already created a school safety advisory council of professionals from North Carolina and beyond, and they are looking at best practices throughout the entire country to determine what we can implement at the statewide level to make sure that every student and every staff member is, um, is safe and able to learn and able to teach. Have you previously held elective or appointed office and why the superintendent of public instruction of, of all offices? Yes. Well, I will tell you, I think that education is the most important issue on the ballot, quite honestly. It is our future. Education and the quality thereof determines the, the future of businesses, as well as every student's success as an adult. And that's why I'm doing this, because um, I have I, I was just on the executive committee with uh, the GOP. I ran for school board here in Cary in 2022. I was not successful, but for the last six years, I've actually actually been an advocate, um, a legislative liaison with the General Assembly, meeting with school board members and county commissioners, as well as um, members of the K through 12 committee in the Senate, as well as the State House, and trying to bring reform that's going to focus on academics for every student, rather than the activism that we see, that we have seen in past years that's robbing our children of the sound basic education that our Constitution um, promises every school-aged child in this state. Um, so I have the answers. I think we definitely need somebody with that's outside to to bring in some practical common sense solutions to what we are dealing with. And that's what is probably one of my greatest qualifications. I'm not entrenched in the bureaucracy. I am not indebted to the system itself. I believe that the system is here to serve our students and not the other way around. And I believe that our students are filled with potential and it's our job to help them to, to figure out what are they good at, what are they passionate at, and to prepare them to be able to enter into the workforce and pursue careers that will make them not only financially independent, but it's also going to be something that can give back to the community and um, and be uh, personally rewarding for each individual. What do you believe 
uh, is in your educational or professional life that has prepared you to run such a large agency and to work collaboratively with the State Board of Education, which is an independent body appointed by the governor? Well, you know, I have been, as I said, I, I'm a nurse of 31 years, so I've been in the emergency room as well as the neurosurgical ICU. I was the only medical professional in the most remote county of the lower 48 states responsible for keeping people safe and um, for um, for safety and, and wilderness survival um, for hundreds of people every year. And I have, as I said, I have been working with legislators in order to pass legislation. I have been working with families and I've actually been traveling the state of North Carolina for the last three years, talking to parents and teachers and students to figure out what direction we need to go in so that our public schools can be the best absolute option for the families in North Carolina. I think what we need is somebody who is able to collaborate, somebody who is a mediator, someone who is a problem solver, and someone who is an excellent communicator, because we need to make sure that our teachers and our, and our families are very well connected so that we can ensure that every student reaches their fullest potential and is ready for adulthood. And I, being a, a nurse, a former missionary, a foster parent, um, as well as teaching 10 years here in Wake County, I taught biology, chemistry, civics, and Spanish as well. And so I have I, my kids have been in public, private, and homeschool. I have a great grasp on what works in all three of those and maybe improvements that need to be made. And so I think that I am the absolute perfect person for this because um, I have ideas, but I've also surrounded myself with people that have been in the education field for decades and they all support me and they want to be a part of my administration and moving forward and making sure that our schools are the best in the country and an example for everyone else to follow. Is there a contradiction between running for this position while homeschooling your kids? I am no longer homeschooling my children. That is um, my my four. Um, I have five children and four of them are graduated. Two of them are married um, and two others. They've graduated college or they're um, they have their own businesses and they're very successful. My fifth child is right now in a private school. Um, I would be more than happy to not pay that fee and put him into a public school. But the public schools that we are um, districted to have horrible, um, horrible um rates of, of violence and bullying. And there's also issues with uh, low literacy rates in both math and reading. So my husband and I are choosing to do what is best for my for my son that's still in the home. Um, and I am now doing this because I know that most parents um, cannot afford to put their children into a private school. And they are very much um, not enjoying what's happening within the public schools. And so I want to help make our public education system be the absolute best it can be and the best option for every family. But I do believe in, in school choice, but there's not much of a choice if the public school traditional system is failing you and you don't even have, there's 37 districts right now that don't even have charter school options for our families. And so, um, and most of our private schools have two and three year wait lists. So we cannot continue on this trajectory and think that the next generation is going to be prepared um, to be the leaders that we need in North Carolina and so that we can stay the economic um, the economic um, strength stronghold that we are. Why are you the better candidate in this race? I'm the best candidate in this race because I am not a part of the system. The system is failing our students from the top down. That's because we are focused too much on political agendas and special pet projects and bureaucracy. Um, we have had incredibly incredible gains or, or um, uh, money that has been spent on administrative costs, and it is not trickling down to our teachers. It's not going to classroom resources, and our students are the ones that are losing out. And so I, I come at this, and I am, I am coming to be, um, to stand up for students, to stand up for families, to focus on the staff, the boots on the ground staff. And my opponent has already spent years um, answering to, um, to big money groups and ra very radical political organizations. And he wants to double down on that happening in our schools. And we cannot continue. Our students are not prepared. They're not able to compete in the marketplace. 
And um, I have just as an anecdotal story, a friend of mine that is a professor in Cornell, and he has said that he can tell when a student has graduated high school out of North Carolina because they are so much less prepared than other students that are coming to his university um, from around the country. That is not what we want to be known for in North Carolina. We want to remain, um, we want to be number one in the country, and I believe that we can do that, but we have got to focus on what is important, and that is academics, and that's safety and discipline in the classroom, and that's expanding the um, uh, vocational education for our 62% of students that don't go on to a four-year degree immediately after high school. Yeah. So one topic I must touch on, uh, there have been several controversial statements attributed to you. Uh -huh. and in, in fact, your opponent uh, brought up some of those. Uh, sure he did. Yeah. Uh, it's been reported that uh, you mentioned that former President Obama should be killed, that uh, President Trump, former President Trump, should have used the military to stay in office. And there have been disparaging remarks regarding the LBGTQ plus community. Uh, are those statements true? Do you, were they made by you? And if, if so, wouldn't that be disqualifying for someone running for this office? Um, there, there are statements that have been completely taken out of context. Yes. And I will tell you and everyone that is listening, I have been making videos and talking to the public and reporting on things for the last seven years. It is not hard to find um, five and six second clips um, out of three and 400 hours worth of video. And I would be, I would caution anyone um, to think that uh, everybody, everybody uses hyperbolic speech. Um, but, it, and I mean, people, when, when uh, President um, Biden said that he wanted to take President Trump behind the woodshed and teach him a lesson or two, nobody actually thought that that was honest and true. Um, but this is very serious. It's serious because uh, my opponent if you will look at the mailers and the amount of, of commercials that he's putting on television, he has done nothing for the last seven months but attack me and malign me and take things out of context. And he has never discussed anything that he wants to fix. He actually has said that his goal is to celebrate the current system. This current system is not serving our communities. And that's why we have the highest attrition rate for teachers ever seen in the state of North Carolina. Did you know that almost 50% of our students are not on grade level in math or in reading. These are serious issues. And if he's just going to continue to talk about things, I can understand. Listen, if I didn't have any ideas or how to solve anything, if I was just going to be a pawn of the bureaucracy, like my opponent is going to be, I understand why he would be attacking me. But, oh, um, oh, are you, are you cutting me off? No. Uh, oh, it says leave meeting. No, you're still good. Okay. Anyway, so I can say I, I am not a politician. I am not a perfect person. I have not always said things in the way that they should be said, but they were, but it was also done in jest or it, hyperbolic and it was done with in personal comments. These were not posts. And so okay. I would, I would tell everyone, um, you know what, our students are suffering and we need somebody outside of the system who has the ideas, has the passion and has the history of making changes um, to be at the helm. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, one last question. The North Carolina General Assembly has been moving public funds away from public schools and toward private schools. Um, there's also questions about the curriculum uh, that is currently being administered in our schools and the use of uncertified teachers. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding those topics? Well, I would say this, there, there is a misunderstanding that the funding that is going toward the, I'm sure you're referring to the private school vouchers, that is not actually coming out of the um, K through 12 budget. That is surplus money that has been that has been um, brought into our state that has been collected in our state over the past few years. So it's a completely separate entity. And I would say this, 
I totally believe that anybody that is receiving tax money needs to be accountable in terms of the academic success of their students. And I think that that's going to be true of anyone that's getting our taxpayer money. But the way that we are right now, as I stated, there are 37 districts that have a lot of failing schools in them and they have no charter school options. So do we just want for those students to just be be left in a school that's not fulfilling their needs, their academic needs? No, this has to be just a short term, a, a short term response to the literacy crisis that we're facing and to the um, to the dangerous situation that a lot of children find themselves in in our schools with the 84 percent increase in drugs and violent crimes within our schools. Um, and so this is not something that I would say is a long term solution. I think that this is just in response to the learning loss that we saw during COVID and now the, the very slow gains that we're making. We're looking at potentially, we're coming up on four and five years that our students have not gotten the education that they need. And so it's time for us to do something just to rescue our kids so that we don't lose them in this generation. Um, but I, I want to I want to do an audit, quite honestly, of the DPI. I think there's way too much waste that's being spent on things that are not helping our children academically or in character development or career preparedness. And that's what I intend to do as superintendent. I'm going to make sure that that money is focused on our students first and on our boots on the ground staff and on classroom resources before it goes anywhere else. Thank you. You now have one minute for a closing statement. Okay, well, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be on here. Um, I am excited because I think that we can make our schools here in North Carolina the absolute best option for every family. I believe that our children are filled with potential. I believe that it should be the, the school's job to work with parents to figure out what really is unique and special about each child and then to put them onto a pathway of success. I want to bring back objective fact-based math. I wanna bring back civics training. I want to bring back um, economics so that our children understand budgeting. I want to make sure that our children have the not only the, the intellect, but they also have the life skills that they need to be successful. And I think that we need to partner with businesses throughout the state of North Carolina so that we can improve economic outcomes in all of our 100 counties. Because if we have strong education systems, then we are going to draw in excellent new businesses to come and to, to make their home here in North Carolina. I believe education is the most important thing in moving forward. And I have, I am very excited about the potential of making North Carolina schools the best in this country and an example for everyone else to follow. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about all the trouble at the beginning <laughs> with the Zoom. Okay. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you. I believe Wesley Harris is with us. Wesley is the Democratic candidate for state treasurer. Yes, sir. Right here. Harris? Yes, sir. All right. You ha I have uh, uh, taken a little bit of time to explain the statutory responsibility of the treasurer's office. Uh, and with that as a background, you have one minute for an opening statement. Absolutely. Well, thank you. It, it's so great to, to join y'all tonight. I'm so, so thankful y'all are here. My name is Wesley Harris. I'm running for state treasurer this year. I currently represent you in the North Carolina State House, uh, represent South Charlotte. I'm actually the only PhD economist in the state legislature with a, a specialty in public finance. And I'm running for state treasurer because state government that invests in our people. I live in Charlotte now, but I grew up in rural North Carolina, a little county called Alexander County in the northwest corner of the a state that invested in me and I had great teachers who, who lifted me up. And so we need to make sure we're investing in our state employees. We're protecting our pension plan. We're protecting our state health plan. And we're making sure our local governments can make the investments they need for their communities to continue to grow. And so uh, very excited to uh, run for this office and excited to talk with you all tonight. Mr. Harris, how did you decide to run for state treasurer? What was the uh, motivating yeah. factor? Absolutely. My time in the two minutes. Yeah, thank you. My time in the legislature has shown me that the Republican supermajority has made just very short sighted financial choices in our state. And I think we need someone running statewide and running the treasurer's office who can go around the state and show people how these choices are affecting their day to day lives. Um, and in addition, in terms of our pension plan, we have one of the best funded pension plans in the country. 
but one of the worst performing. And that is why we can't give a cost of living adjustment to our state employees. Uh, our state health plan has been cutting benefits over the past couple of years. So we can't give quality health insurance to our state employees. And so if we're not going to pay them well, we're not giving them a good retirement, we're not giving them great health care, it's no wonder that you have a 25% vacancy rate in state employment across this state. And as someone who grew up because of those investments in me, because of those great state employees, my mom what was a lifelong public school teacher. I and invest in our people. We have to invest in our state employees. And, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, as we've cut taxes on the state level, our state simply pushing those responsibilities onto our county governments. Last year, 92 counties had to raise property taxes. The year before, it was 90 counties. And I'll tell you this, no one's ever gone broke paying income tax because you got to earn that money before you can tax it. But if you're taxing property at a higher level, that's people's wealth. The only wealth generating assets so many families have, they're getting taxed on even though their incomes aren't rising. And so we're actually pricing folks out of their homes. And so I'm running for this office because we need someone to run statewide to show people what's happening and be an advocate for the greatest asset the state has, our people. Yeah. Before you joined the, the call, I mentioned that the incumbent has received some criticism for the low rates of return experience and the heavy ca allocation to cash that's been uh, maintained over the last period. How would you better manage that risk return trade off? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great question. That's really the biggest thing with the pension plan. You know, we have a $125 billion pension plan. Of that, 14% of that is sitting in cash. Uh, to put that in comparison, the rest of the country, every pension plan in the country has that rate at 2%. Um, last year, the Dow Jones had about a 20% rate of return. Our pension plan had an 8% rate of return. And it's because we're simply not investing that cash. Um, and that's really it. That, that's that's the simple explanation. We just have to invest that cash. We don't need to be super aggressive with it. Invest in private equity, invest in super risky assets that rise and fall and are super volatile. We can just invest in the market. We can invest in index funds, make sure we're focusing on companies that do right by North Carolinians and do right by North Carolina. And we can, again, if we have just, we could have taken two thirds of that cash balance invested it in just index funds over the past two years, and we would have had an extra $10 billion in our pension plan without even taking on excessive risk, uh, just the same risk as the normal stock market. And we would have been able to provide any cost of living adjustment we could have dreamed of for our retirees. At the same time, we actually could have lowered employee contributions that could have helped stabilize the healthcare program. And so you don't have to be super risky with this, but you do actually have to invest the money. And if you do that, the returns will be so much that we can actually improve the quality of life of all our retirees and help recruit more people into the state employment system. Your opponent has an asset management background. Mm -hmm. Why are you the better candidate for this position? I'm the better candidate because I grew up in North Carolina. I know what North Carolina is capable of. And my background in the legislature as the only the insight into our state's finances that no one else has. You would be hard pressed to find someone who understands the state's finances better than I do. Um, and before I was in the legislature, I was an international tax consultant and I worked on valuing assets, very complex companies. And so I have a background in, in valuing assets and portfolio and putting and looking at portfolios and how they perform. And everyone who depends on the state treasurer's role has endorsed me in this race the North Carolina Association of Educators, the State Employees Association of North Carolina, the Professional Firefighters and Paramedics of North Carolina, the Association of North Carolina. Every group that actually depends on the pension plan, depends on the state health plan, has endorsed me because they know I believe to manage our plan in an appropriate manner, not give it to their Wall Street buddies, but actually invest in our people. And additionally, my opponent actually wants to give away the power of sole fiduciary to the legislature. He wants a committee to determine how those investments are. And in North Carolina, if you give it to a committee, you give it to a committee of the legislature where they get to pick who manages your money. I want to keep accountability in the office where the voters have the say on who gets to manage their money, not Phil Berger and Tim Moore collected with their political cronies. Looks like you anticipated my next question. Uh, again, one of the things I mentioned before you came online is uh, we're one of the few states that has the sole trustee model. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you is, do you believe that that's the best governance structure 
or should we go to something else? I do believe it's the best government structure. And I apologize for my uh, for my signal. I'm actually in the attic of somebody's house at another event I was in, but uh, uh, hopefully it'll it'll stay uh, stay fixed. But what the what the structure does now is it gives accountability. It makes sure that the voters get their say on who manages their money. Um, and again, if they manage the money poorly, they get voted out of office. And, and I think that is the most important piece, because if you do not have that level of accountability, you get appointed somebody appointed that they are not accountable to the voters. They are not accountable to the people. They're accountable to the special interests. They're accountable to their political counterparts that put them in that position. And so if things need to change, that the voters want to change, they have no control to change that. And so yeah, I'm a very large opponent of making sure that we have that level of accountability. That's why I'm running on my background. That's why I'm running on my vision for North Carolina. And I think that's why everyone who depends on the pension plan has endorsed us for this race. And I'm honored to have their endorsement. We've put a lot of emphasis on managing pension fund assets, but the state treasurer has other responsibilities. What do you view as the major responsibilities of the office and how would you undertake them? Uh, sorry, you broke up right when you said which which area. Could you repeat that? My question is, uh, what other responsibilities other than pension management uh, does the state treasurer have, and how would you go about undertaking those responsibilities? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so they manage the state health plan. They're the chair of the state health plan, and they manage the local government commission. Uh, and counties to make sure every every locality is in really good shape, make sure they can afford the debt that they take on. Um, and then the state health plan makes sure that everyone who devotes their life, devotes their career to the people of North Carolina, tackling the healthcare system, we have to focus on A, standing up to hospitals, standing up to pharmaceutical companies so that we get fair prices on preventative care, on wellness care, so that our overall population is healthier which can lower healthcare costs and help them so that can further lower healthcare costs as well. Um, but again, yeah, looking at the local government commission, it is imperative that our counties have the ability to make the investments that they need. Um, and I think going around and showing people, as I mentioned before, 92 counties had to raise property taxes last year because they're having to fill the gaps of what the state is not doing. Almost every county, 20% of their county budget is going to things that the state should be providing. And that's leading to higher property taxes. And that's preventing them from building new schools. That's preventing them from, in, from investing in, um, in parks and recs and the things that those counties need to do. And so people are actually paying more and we're getting less. And so running the, the local government commission so we can do what we can to make sure counties and loca local governments stay solvent, but then also help them make the investments that their communities need to grow. Is there anything else you would like our audience to know about you or the office that I haven't asked? Yeah, uh, you know, it's I, I think this is one of the unique offices in North Carolina that has a defined constituency, and that is the state employment, uh, the state employees. As I like to say, you cannot have a state government that works for everybody if you don't have people willing to work for the state government. Uh, we have 100 counties. In 61 counties, the largest employer are our is the state government, is some form of state agency. In 51 counties, it's the school system. And so if we want our economy to grow, if we want opportunity to be in every single county in this state to have that potential, we have to invest in our state employees because they are the ones, it doesn't matter what policies you pass in the legislature, doesn't matter what you do on every level of government. If you don't have good people out there working for the government, then you're not gonna have a good government. And so making sure that we do right by the people who, invest, who devote their lives, devote their careers to the people of North Carolina, is one of the greatest things about this job and something I'm so excited to go out there and make sure that we're investing in them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Harris. You have one minute for a closing statement. Yeah. Thank you. And, and thank you all again so much for joining us. Like I said, my name is Wesley Harris. I'm running for state treasurer because we have every single potential in North Carolina this year to show people what it's like to have a state that invests in them. You know, we're the only state, we're the only swing state in the country that has a, as high of a rural population as we do. So in order for us to really succeed, we have to bridge that urban rural divide more so than any other state in the country. And so if we're able to do that, we can actually show the rest of the country what it means to come together and govern in an efficient manner. And in my opinion, the best way to do that is to have a government that invests in its people, to have a government that makes sure that every corner of this state 
has the potential, has the opportunity that I was blessed with. And I, my aspect of looking at this job is making sure that our finances are in order so we can make those investments in our people, because that's how North Carolina grows stronger. And that's how we can transform this state, transform this country. And so thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. You have heard from one of the candidates for governor. Let's go back to that race. Uh, hopefully Mike Ross is with us. Is Mr. Ross with us? Mr. Ross is the Libertarian candidate for governor. Is he not with us? Okay. We'll then move to the state auditor race. The auditor, auditor's office examines all areas of state government to implement government services and uncover wasteful spending by conducting financial statement audits, performance audits, investigative reports, and information technology audits. The office also conducts special studies as requested by the General Assembly. Most states require the state auditor to be a CPA. North Carolina uh, does not. Uh, I believe we have uh, two of the three candidates running for state auditor uh, joining us this evening. Uh, hopefully, Bob Drock is with us. Yes, hello, Bob Drock here. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Bob is the Libertarian candidate for state auditor. Uh, you have one minute for an opening statement. Yeah, well, th thank you very much. Uh, apologize for my video. I look like a Rembrandt painting, but that's we'll live with that tonight. My name is Bob Drock. I'm a candidate for North Carolina State Auditor. I'm a certified management accountant. And so uh, I'm an accountant running for auditor, which sounds kind of kind of like you would expect. But as you outlined in your introduction, that's not required in North Carolina. So I am the only accountant that's running for North Carolina State Auditor. My opponents are both uh, are both lawyers. So I've, I'm running strongly on my resume. Not only have I got a, I'm a certified management accountant, I worked for over four years for Deloitte. Deloitte is one of the leading uh, accounting, audit, tax consulting firms in the uh, in the world. And I've got a, a master's of business degree uh, from uh, Stanford University. So I've got strong professional credentials for this role. And I appreciate you, uh, appreciate your consideration for North Carolina State Auditor. And I appreciate the music also. Absolutely. I'm gonna ask you uh, a series of questions. You'll have up to two minutes to uh, respond. The first question is, have you previously run for or held elective office or appointed office for that matter? And can a libertarian candidate win a statewide race? Okay, uh, I'll answer the, the, the previous office question first. Um, I've not run for an office. I have been appointed to the uh, New Hanover County Board of Equalization and Review. I served for four years on that board. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, equalization and review, the county assessor will look at property values throughout the county. If somebody disagrees with their assessment, they will um, try to resolve that with the assessor's office. If they can't resolve it, that gets um, appealed to a board of equalization and review. So I uh, spent four years listening to uh, property owners, explaining why they disagreed on their property assessments. Uh, I listened to this to the state audit, to the state um, analysts and and heard their rationale, and I would uh, with my fellow board members side with either the uh, county assessor or the uh, the um, citizen. And as a as a libertarian candidate, I believe power to the people, and um, I'd often uh, make sure I listen carefully to the citizens' arguments and and uh, favor the citizen where I could. Uh, now, can a, can a libertarian win a statewide office? Well, uh, I'll tell you what, when I'm out canvassing 
and I tell people that I'm an accountant, uh, they say, yeah, I've got, you know, we should have an accountant. And, and when I explain to people that I'm independent, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I don't have a conflict of interest uh, because libertarians are, are, are not prevalent in state government. Uh, and that's a compelling argument. Uh, we want our we want our auditor to be an accountant. We want an auditor to be independent, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, uh, I think of of all I think of all uh, offices, the auditor is a great one for an independent candidate. Okay, what motivated you to run for statewide office? Well, for, uh, for state auditor specifically. Yeah, state auditor specifically. A lot of you are familiar with the mess that's in the state auditor's office. The prior state auditor, uh, she had to resign because of ethical issues. Now, account the, the accounting profession is all about ethics. The uh, the uh, current state auditor is a political appointee. And um, I looked at that back in December. And I looked at my skill set. I've explained I'm an accountant. I've got a I work for a big accounting firm. I've got an MBA from a, from a great university. I'm qualified for this office. And the office has got problems. Um, you've all worked in an organization where you've had problems uh, in management. And that creates bad morale throughout the organization. And um, I would contend that a political appointee is not the solution to a morale problem in a, in a significant organization, a professional organization. Uh, so this is an area where I think I can uniquely serve the citizens of North Carolina. I believe strongly in public service. I was a Peace Corps volunteer early in my life. So I've got a track record of, of public service and sacrifice. I think it's important to the community. And I think it's an obligation of all of us who have the ability to serve to uh, to do it when, when we can be of service. So um, for all those reasons, I'm running for North Carolina State Auditor. If elected, what new policies or procedures would you implement in the office? Well, my my uh, agenda for the first 12 months of office would be triage. I've already mentioned that there are there are issues in the office. Um, the staffing levels are down 20 percent from from their peak. The um, the number of audits that have been issued by the that have been uh, published to the state website are down by 20% since uh, April of this year. And um, there's a significant issue with, with both staffing, morale, and output at the office. So I think we need to focus on supporting the good people in the state auditor's office. We need to recruit and retain uh, uh, additional professional staff. We need to um, start measuring our performance based on um, throughput in the office, make, su make sure we're doing the, the uh, financial audits that are required and taking on as many investigative audits as we possibly can. And we have to leverage our people with technology. Um, you know, uh, we know the rate of technology is moving so rapidly. Uh, whatever level of technology we have in the state auditor's office, we need to improve that. But my last job before uh, leaving industry, I was, a, I was the uh, chief information officer for a $500 million company. So I understand technology and how to implement and how to how to use it to leverage uh, leverage the human resources in, in, in the business or in this case, in, in the auditor's office. Um, so uh, uh, that's what I would be would be focused on for the first 12 months. And um, I, I think the auditor's office just needs to get restored to a state where it's it's uh, uh, performing the duties of finding waste, fraud and abuse and making sure that the resources of the state go to the go to the intended recipients. You cited your, your MBA and your CMA and some of your professional experience, but have you served in an audit role book previously? So I've worked with auditors. I have not served in an audit role in the, in the uh, formal sense that the American Institute of CPAs requires. Um, so that is a distinction between my accounting experience and that of a CPA. Uh, you know, in this race, uh, there's good, better, best. I think good is a qualified professional, and both of my opponents are uh, good people. Uh, better 
is someone that has an accounting background and years of experience working with auditors, uh, working in the accounting profession, and that's me. And then best would be a CPA. And uh, we don't have that choice in North Carolina this year. Um, so uh, I think any voter can look into the, to me and my opponents and, and make that same conclusion. Thank you. You now have one minute for a closing statement. Well, thank you very much. Um, I talked a little bit about the importance of independence. And you asked me about, uh, the, you know, can a libertarian win a state uh, audit race? Uh, the American Institute of CPAs, the professional organization that's, uh, that kind of runs the audit profession, they say that an auditor should be independent in both fact and appearance. Well, when you have Democrats auditing Democrats or Republicans auditing Republicans, that does not appear to be uh, independent. There's an inherent conflict there. So my opponents are conflicted. I am the only candidate that's a, a certified management accountant and a, uh, a independent in both fact and appearance. I have the qualifications and I would ask people to look at the race, look at my qualifications, and vote for Bob Drock for North Carolina State Auditor. That was perfect. Your timing. <laughs> Thank yeah, I you. I like that we, music. We appreciate <laughs> your participation with us this evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate you hosting this. Okay. Uh, Mr. Drock's opponent is Jessica Holmes. Is Ms. Holmes with us? Yes, I am. Very good. I want to welcome you to our forum. Uh, Ms. Holmes, we just heard from your opponent. Uh, we will allow you one minute for an opening statement, up to two minutes to respond to questions that I pose, and then a minute for a closing statement. Ready? Yes. All right. Your opening statement, please. Oh, good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for hosting this opportunity. Um, I. Uh, for my sores in the room, I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and the first woman of color to ever serve on North Carolina's Council of State um, in our state's history. Uh, my opponent talked a lot about the qualifications or lack thereof um, of his opponents that said, I'm the only person that has ever been elected by the people to serve in any level of capacity. Um, formerly as a Wake County Commissioner, managing an over $1 billion budget and over 4,000 employees. And I think we also heard multiple times that there is not a CPA candidate um, that will be on your ballot. But in terms of the things that happened in the office, those things are past tense. And I would also like to thank you. You were appointed to the position in 2023 by Governor Cooper. What have you learned in your time in office and why are you the best candidate in this race? Um, one of the things that I've learned in this office is the reality that all of state government is experiencing a over 20% um, vacancy rate. And that is due to the General Assembly's failure to give state employees the raises that they need in order for us to be competitive in the private market. Um, in terms of good, better, and best, I am the best candidate in this race. Again, I am the only one that has ever been elected um, in any capacity whatsoever. Um, and my commissioner experience is particularly important because the state auditor sits on the local government commission which oversees the fiscal management of local governments across our state. Yeah. Your campaign website says that you have delivered on performing impactful audits and investigative reports, exposing hundreds of thousands of dollars of fraud, waste and abuse of taxpayer dollars. Can you provide some examples of your successes? Um, I'll give you several. Um, for starters, the statewide single audit, which accounts for the federal funds that have come in in fiscal year 2023. 
which was in excess of about $35 billion. Um, also, uh, not too long ago, we released an audit that identified about $700,000 in fraudulent uh, P card use or credit card use um, at one of our UNC system colleges. And also, we are actively working right now to make sure every penny that comes into North Carolina um, for individuals impacted by storms is getting to the people and places that need it most. If elected, what would be your priorities for the next four years? Um, for starters, we have already changed our methodology in terms of how we triage, check mark. Um, also, in terms of advocating at the General Assembly to make sure that we can hire and retain the best talent and not continue to lose our talent to the private sector. So that's also a high priority. My number one priority is conducting impactful audits that make sure that federal and state funds get to the people and places that need it most. As a beneficiary of many of those services, for example, SNAP benefits, affordable housing growing up, it's not just a, a political talking point to me to do this job well. It is a personal opportunity for me to pay it forward. Um, as hence my demonstrated interest and dedication of my life's work to public service. Your opponent, whom we just heard from, has made a big deal of uh, electing someone with an accounting background. It's my understanding that um, you're legally trained. Is, is, is that uh, something you found to be an advantage or a disadvantage uh, in this position? Considering that my opponent is not a CPA and uh, seemed to fumble a bit on that question as to how his particular qualifications match up to the job of state auditor. But yes, I do believe that my legal skills and my analytical skills, my public office, my ability to actually lead an agency um, is, is sound and unmatched by either of my opponents. It's been reported that your predecessor, Beth Wood, a Democrat, has endorsed your Republican opponent. Uh, is that true? And if so, why, why did that happen? Um, that's an excellent question. I am still scratching my head um, as to that. And then she went further to say that essentially that I was only appointed because I am black and because I am a woman. What I would say to that or directly to her as the first woman state auditor who walked around for years uh, with that tagline um, is that the question shouldn't be why you know, why I'm, the question should be why I'm at the table, not whether I belong at the table. And so uh, she knows me well, and um, I would not and have never requested her endorsement and would not accept it considering that she resigned because of a, as a part of her plea deal to criminal charges. So I understand that, you know, she wants to give advice. Um, she has also mentioned that I have not taken any of her advice because I do not want to lead um, in a way that I'm throwing stones from glass houses. I believe in integrity and I believe that my job is to serve the people, not my pocket. I saw a statistic that indicated that major audits in the first seven months of this year were significantly less than the seven months of 2023. What do you attribute that to? And is that something that you expect to change going forward? Um, yes, that statistic is, is accurate. And a part of the reason is the fact that I inherited audits that were several years old hmm. that we attempted to triage and assess how to move forward with those. And so in auditor speak, 
um, typically an audit should not have a birthday. And I inherited many audits that had been on the shelf, on the table for years on end as the office played whack-a-mole and went from one topic to another as opposed to finishing many audits that were in progress. And yes, and absolutely, um, once I have more control over how we triage and all of the new cases come in, then I very much look forward to being realistic in terms of what our output and making sure that we are maximizing our time and not chasing headlines. Thank you. You now have one minute for a closing statement. Again, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to be here. I, I see there are lots of people on the Zoom and it's great to see so many friendly faces. But again, if we're going from good, better to best, then I am the best candidate in this race, not because I'm black and not because I'm a woman, because but because I am the most qualified candidate and has actually been elected by at large in Wake County by over 1 million people who said yes to Jessica. And Thank I'm asking you, so you all to do the same. Okay. Always ask for the vote. Thank you. We appreciate it. Our final Bye. good to see you. Okay. Our final race is Attorney General. The Attorney General is the state's chief legal officer. The Attorney General provides representation and advice to all state government departments, agencies, and commissions, writes legal opinions, and litigates in criminal appeals cases. There are two candidates in this race. I'm sure you've probably seen the TV ads. Uh, and Jeff Jackson, the Democratic candidate for Attorney General, uh, has agreed to join us. Uh, saw an interesting fact, and I haven't been able to verify this, but every site I've looked at has reported that the last Republican candidate to win election as Attorney General was in 1896. And I just find that hard to believe. Uh, but anyway, hopefully Mr. Jackson is, is on. Are you, sir? I am. Oh, fantastic. And your statistic is true. It's actually one of the longest unbroken streaks in American political history. We did have a Republican serve as attorney right. general about 40 years ago. He was appointed. We have not had one elected since the late 1800s. Wow, that's great. That puts a little pressure on you. Okay, you have one minute for an opening statement. Thank you. Good to see all of you. My name is Jeff Jackson. I'm running for attorney general. I currently serve as a member of Congress for our 14th district. That's basically the bottom half of Mecklenburg and most of Gaston County. Before that, served in the state Senate for four terms. Before that, was an assistant district attorney in Gaston County. And before that, served with the Army in Afghanistan. I am currently a major in the National Guard. This is my 22nd year in the military. I am running for attorney general because I've seen how Josh has done that job. I saw how Roy Cooper did the job before, and I believe they used this position as the people's attorney. It's your job to be a shield for people against those who would mean them harm, whether it's folks pushing fentanyl into our communities or scammers coming after your bank account or folks polluting the air and water. That's the essence of the job, and that's what I would like to do with the job. Thank you. Mr. Jackson, you and your opponent are running what appears to be dueling ads regarding who will keep us safe. Why are you the better candidate to keep us safe, and what will you keep us safe from? Um, I have been a prosecutor. That's the first bullet point there. My opponent has never prosecuted a single case. The fact that I have served as a prosecutor means that I've worked with law enforcement. My opponent has never worked with law enforcement. If you look at his ads, they're written by consultants using all of the buzzwords that you would use. What I'm trying to campaign on is actual experience having done the job. Attorney General is our state's top prosecutor. It really is not designed for someone who has never prosecuted a single case. What would I keep you safe from? Give you a quick example. I think uh, the fentanyl issue is day one. 
Everybody's entitled to know what your day one issue would be as attorney general. Mine would be combating the fentanyl epidemic. Here's how. The General Assembly did something good a few months ago. They passed an anti-money laundering law. We were a state that didn't have one. It goes into effect in December. What I would like to do is aggressively use the new anti-money laundering law that we have to do a better job of identifying the distribution cells for fentanyl that exists within our state and breaking them apart. That's the supply side. On the demand side, the gold standard for saving lives for fentanyl users is called medicated assisted treatment. Josh Stein did a very good job of informing our General Assembly about why they should support medicated assisted treatment. About a third of our counties are doing a good job using that. My job is to partner with the other two thirds to push it out and to save lives. If elected, how would you put your personal stamp on the office? You've already mentioned that you would be uh, preceded by Governor Cooper and and just Josh Stein. How would a Jackson administration be different, if at all, from what we have already experienced? I don't have all the answers to that question yet. There's one way in which I think it would be somewhat different. I think there is a new threat that's approaching and getting trying to get ahead of that threat will be one of the defining features, at least early on, and that is artificial intelligence. I think the next round of scammers will have artificial intelligence and that will make them much more sophisticated. That means that our defenses against them have to become more sophisticated. My plan is immediately after being sworn in on January 1, go to the state legislature and ask them for tools to help basically create a very hostile rep reputation as a state for that type of predator to achieve some level of deterrence before this technology is so cheap that it's everywhere. We have to, those folks have to know you do not want to come to North Carolina. They will treat you with a special level of hostility. And I need the General Assembly's help in order to help me do that. But we are going to be growing through an artificial intelligence revolution for as long as I'm in office, if elected, grappling with that and defending us against the different ways in which it could be a threat. It's not all bad. There will be benefits to come from it, but there will be particular threats. That's going to be something that Roy and Josh, frankly, didn't have to deal with. If elected, how do you see yourself working with the Republican-led legislature? It's a good question. When I served in the state Senate, uh, all four terms were served on the state, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee would be the main point of intersection between my office as AG and at least the state Senate. I know those folks. I have a good working relationship with them. If I have to bring them some proposals, which I will from time to time, I think they will be received well, as long as I intend for them to be nonpartisan or, or bipartisan proposals. My idea of how to do this job is that it should be done in a basically nonpartisan way. Like we, I just heard Jessica, she's been a friend for years. I think she has the same basic idea about being an auditor. Auditor is not supposed to be done in a manner that is a partisan uh, performance. This is fundamentally a law enforcement position. If I approach it in a way that's nonpartisan, and if I treat the General Assembly with, with that kind of respect, I believe they'll reciprocate it. Not always. There are going to be some moments of tension, but I think it will be a, a relationship built on mutual understanding and respect. On a lighter note, it's been said that the AG and Attorney General stands for almost government. So if elected, is there a campaign for governor down the road? I, I don't really think so. No, I've I, I've never aspired to that. I went to law school to become a prosecutor because I had it in my head that that would just be a really great job. And then I loved it. And I was going to continue being a prosecutor until one day uh, there was a vacancy in our state Supreme Court, in our state Senate rather, and I was appointed to fill the vacancy. And you're not allowed to be a legislator and a, a prosecutor at the same time, or I would have kept that job. This lets me go back to my roots and basically be the top prosecutor for the state. It's a dream job. It's a job in public service where you just get to wake up every day, not really thinking about politics, but just thinking about doing the right thing. I just can't imagine a better job in public service than that. Okay. 
you've received uh, a great deal of acclaim for your ability to communicate with your constituents, whether it's TikTok videos or uh, emails, et cetera. Can we expect that same level of communication to continue in this office? Absolutely. However, I'm under no illusions that the natural level of interest in an AG is as high as a member of Congress simply because Congress is in the national headlines all the time. And so a lot of stuff that I talk about will take people behind those headlines. I'm not going to have the same level of opportunity to do that. However, I, I'm going to be interested in what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. And hopefully conveying that will also be of interest to others. But the reason I do that is because I consider it at this point to be part of my job. People expect to hear from me on a pretty regular basis about work that I'm doing on their behalf. I would absolutely seek to continue it. It would be a joy to do so. I've really enjoyed that part of public service. Okay. You have one minute, sir, for a closing statement. I see a lot of friendly faces here. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time. We are coming to the home stretch now, and I'm going to experience something I've never experienced before as a candidate, which is, uh, and Mr. Evans referenced this, wall-to-wall -wall attack ads between now and the election across the entire state. That's going to be a new experience for me and, frankly, for my wife and kids. But we are willing to do it because we believe so strongly in the contrast, frankly, between myself and my opponent and what it would mean for the state if someone like my opponent were to become attorney general. We feel really good about how this is going. We feel really good about the service that we can offer the state. I would ask for your support, and I look forward to seeing all of you in person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Take care. This concludes our candidate discussions. I want to thank all of the candidates who participated. And I certainly want to thank you, the streaming audience, for uh, staying with us uh, through the little challenges that we had earlier. Uh, Mr. Love, I turn the program back to you for any closing remarks. I'm sorry, I was trying to speak on mute. <laughs> Let me express my sincere thanks to you, Mr. Evans, for doing such a fantastic job as moderator. I'd also like to uh, thank Ms. Withers and Ms. Pryor, our timekeepers. I do have a few announcements, as you will see uh, scrolled across the screen. Uh, October the 11th is the deadline uh, for registration. Early voting in North Carolina will begin on Thursday, October the 17th. Absentee ballots due October the 29th. And the deadline for receipt of, of the absentee ballots is on November the 5th, election day, which is also on November the 5th. I have two announcements that you will not see on the screen. And that is there will be a voter unification uh, stroll to the polls. It will, it will be an awareness to engage our community. It'll, it'll, it'll start on uh, Sunday, October the 20th. We will start at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church and move uh, to the Regional Library on Beatty's Ford Road. We'll start at 11.30 until 2. The second announcement is the Health and Wellness Ministry will partner with One Blood Drive on October the 27th from 10 a.m. to 1 and it will start at, at friendship also. Again, thank you for all who participate. We welcome you back uh, next Tuesday, same time for the second installment of this political forum, at which time we will have candidates for the Supreme Court in Mecklenburg and the state uh, positions and, and, and the city council. So uh, thank you again and, and good night. Thank you. Please complete the survey if you have time.